So my my next talk is, uh, as Ardo said, going out more broadly to talk about sitting less and more moving more as public health priorities. And I I want to just try to elaborate a little on the broader guiding frameworks that I and a lot of my colleagues have used to shape our work strategically and to link our research programs out to public health in a, a more explicit kind of way. So what I'll be talking about is uh, just brief comments, I hope. I need to move quickly through an ecological model of health behaviour, what's the background and logic, uh, what are some of the things we've found about the environmental correlates of physical activity because you'll see this environmental theme come through very strongly in my talk. And then I'll talk a bit about examples of this kind of approach from our work at Swinburne University looking at urban environments and health. Uh, that's particularly important because these days we're seeing urbanisation all over the world, we're seeing populations moving to cities and we need to think about the world in which a lot of people are living now and more are going to be living, how can these be thought, thought about in ways that they will be more healthy and active places? And I'll show you some of what we've done to build those links, the evidence links between environments, behaviour and health, but thought about, of course, more broadly. So what about an ecological model? Why do we need that? Well, I always like this. This is from Lawrence Goston, who is a, a regular commentator on social justice and public health who will pop up in generally the American Medical Association, really interesting places. And he's a really a kind of public health lawyer who thinks through social justice issues in interesting ways. And his line is, is pretty fundamental. He, he just says, well, we've got to pro prioritise prevention, regulate industry, alter the built environment, and if we're going to do this, we need good quality evidence that will underpin and inform these kinds of approaches. So I just love this as a way of thinking about things, especially given uh, what has happened. And this is great work from another brilliant US public health thinker. And this is Barry Popkin's work documenting what's happened to different kinds of activity you know, over decades with the kinds of technological innovations that we've seen. And just if you just stare at that, this line here is the representation of up to just before 2010 sedentary time and what's their projection for that and then what they're suggesting is going to happen to really reduce energy expenditure and of course the socio-political context of this and what might happen in uh, in the USA over the next couple of years is going to be particularly interesting and this social justice element of things I think is particularly important and I, I like to use this slide with permission of uh, the people who are in it through my colleague Wendy Hoy at the University of Queensland who does a lot of work on diabetic kidney disease in Indigenous Australian people. Now these are people from the Tiwi Islands up in the north of Australia between Australia and New Guinea and if you go back uh, to the time of the grandfathers of these young men here who are contemporary Tiwi Islanders, their grandfathers looked very, very different indeed. They were leading a traditional lifestyle, their lives weren't westernised, they didn't have television, they didn't have poor quality junk food where they got things, they hunted, they gathered and they were very different biologically and behaviourally to their grandsons who you see there. So 
that I think is a as a just a very compelling example from Australia of how social disadvantage and of course colonization and you know what has happened over the decades with exploitation of the resources of our country is, has led to for the traditional people who are now you know, among the most socially disadvantaged in our society. So it's very good, I think, to keep, re we know this, but we need to keep reminding ourselves of it and we need to keep remembering that the work we do is so important because it brings in evidence about the things we might be able to do that could make important differences. So the behavioural epidemiology framework that I've mentioned to you and partly explained kind of points to the dimensions within which we need high quality evidence to inform public health strategy that should be able to make important differences. And thinking about that, often in research and in some areas of public health research, and if you think about it, ideas that have come out of research and theorising from the USA, which is a highly individualistic culture with a whole lot of baggage that in influences the thinking of people, we have ended up with ideas about individual responsibility, self-determination, self-efficacy. You know, what can people do to help themselves when their behaviour is determined so much by the social and environmental arrangements around them that they deal with habitually and have to navigate. So it's not an issue of individual choice. It's an issue of social justice and looking at the complex determinants of behaviour that to our, our way of thinking are fundamentally environmental and social. And I do like this because here is a Canadian who had his career in the USA at Stanford, Albert Bandura, who's been a very influential thinker through social cognitive and social learning theory about what are the determinants of behaviour. And he's got a very interesting thing in his book he wrote in 1969, um, which was uh, basically uh, you know, about social learning. How do people navigate the social world and learn how what behaviours work for them and what behaviours don't. And, you know, he's got quite a sophisticated view, but what I really like is his statement is that when environmental conditions exercise powerful constraints on behaviour, they emerge as the overriding determinants. Now, that was a PhD student of mine, Nancy Humpel, and I said to Nancy one day, Nancy, there, in this book, I know that there is a wonderful quote that sums up how we can best think about the determinants of behaviour. You should read this book and you should find this quote for me. And Nancy did. So thank you, Nancy. It really is, I think, a, a wonderful job. We don't, these days, we don't often have to read through whole books explaining whole theories. But Albert Bandura has been such an influential thinker and especially about what is it that are the important determinants of behaviour. Now, Jim Salas and I kind of built on Bandura's ideas that we, we thought were pretty good. Uh, Jim and I went, met when we were postdocs at Stanford uh, back in the 1980s. I, I was a Kellogg Foundation Fellow, so I, I don't have much moral high ground to berate my colleagues about taking research funding from Coca-Cola or the crooked food and beverage industry when uh, I took uh, Kellogg money to, uh, to do a, do a postdoc. So it's, it's, it's a sort well, 
It's maybe not as bad as Coca-Cola, but when you look at breakfast cereals, it may not be that much better. We, we need to think about that. But anyway, Jim and I developed what we uh, put forward as not an ecological model of health or, or environment, but an ecological model of health behaviours. So how do we think about behaviours as being subject to multiple levels of influence, especially the environmental contexts in which they take place? And we borrowed the idea of behaviour settings from ecological psychology, social and physical situations that restrict the range of behaviour by promoting and sometimes demanding certain actions and discouraging and prohibiting others. And of course it's complex. These you know, influences interact across social, environmental and, le and other levels. And we've really put a proposal to the, the idea that if we think about thing, these things, they need to be behaviour specific. So the social, environmental and other determinants of food choices conceptually and practically might end up being rather different to the things that are important for physical activity or sedentary behaviour. So building up the idea that things should be behaviour specific and we made the case that if you're going to change things, you really do need to think about intervening, not just at the level of motivating individuals or you know, doing things within little bits of social systems, but thinking about things much more broadly on multiple levels. So that's kind of our, our story and our ecological model. And uh, this, is, this is the thing that we put together to try to explain this. This is large and complex. Uh, we elaborated on this. We originally developed it for physical activity and then we elaborated on it for sedentary behaviour to look through and say, well, for sedentary behaviour, what are the factors you know, at the level of you know, in things within the individual like you know, discomfort and pain, and other things that might mean people sit more, you know, right through to occupation, transport, contexts and settings, and then going out to you know, the characteristics of policies and environments in which people go about their lives in different ways. So that's rather a, a big and complex egg. Uh, and you know, like, like the proverbial uh, um, curate's egg in, uh, in English, English literature and idiom. Uh, when the curate was asked about a boiled egg he was given, uh, he said to the person who gave him the egg to eat, ah, yes, this egg is good in parts. So we hope that our, our egg is good in parts more than it is bad in parts. And of course, a lot of this has not been empirically tested, but it's a, a way of thinking and a style of conceptualising things that we think is helpful. So uh, we started to do some work that we thought would be important for this. We applied for the to the National Institutes of Health with Ilse de Bordedui from Ghent University, Jim Salas and myself, and we did what we called the International Physical Activity in the Environment Project, where we measured physical activity levels in different countries and looked at, at physical activity and activity-friendly environments. So we measured walkability, and we got samples from all of these countries and it's very interesting to look and see you know activity friendly built environments how they might how they exist in Japan which is very interesting and what things look like in Hong Kong which is highly walkable you know it shows a lot of interesting variation in activity and people's physical activity in their daily lives as a function of what the built environments are around them and what they look like, especially around the idea of walkability. And this is just another little infographic that I won't go into in detail, but 
what it does is it shows uh, some of the differences that we see in people's physical activity and just how much more active people seem to be in New Zealand, in Hong Kong, uh, Czech Republic, compared to the samples we've got from the USA and I think paradoxically in Belgium where we expected people to be a lot more physically active but of course that doesn't include bicycle riding which takes up, includes a lot of the activity of, uh, of Belgian people. So that's some of the findings from kind of our original work trying to tease these things apart. Now here's some work we did at, we've been doing recently at Swinburne University within the Centre for Urban Transitions and within that centre we have a Healthy Cities program and the Healthy Cities program its goal is to enhance population health through evidence that can inform environmental initiatives and policies. So we're looking at built environments and health outcomes. We're trying to make sense of what urban green spaces might do for people's activity and health uh, and other things that might influence health than activity. Uh, we're using transport surveys a lot and our focus really is on can we get evidence to inform environmental approaches to reduce health inequalities. And this just gives you a, a kind of schematic overview of what our model is. And we're very interested in sedentary travel and car use, physical activity, and do the attributes of the environments in people in which people live, density, mixed land use, connected streets, urban sprawl where people have no choice other than driving and then access to parks and greenery, how might those attributes influence cardiometabolic health, particularly through physical activity and sedentary time? Now, clearly other things are going on, but that's what we think is important and what we want to do. And uh, we did another one of those clever little text analysis things on our papers to see what are the things that came up as big strong keywords that occurred frequently and really jumped out of our papers. And that was actually pretty cool because we thought, oh, okay, we are actually doing what we say we're gonna do. I was quite delighted with how that image came through, but it is interesting that uh, our most, our focus we really want to build, SES is down there, but socioeconomic comes through quite strongly and then variations. I, I just love staring at those things and thinking about each of the words. And this is our group. Um, our group is led by Professor Takemi Sugiyama and Takemi and I have worked together for many decades. He originally trained as an engineer and uh, designed turbines for Mitsubishi, then trained as an architect and then came in to work on environment, behaviour and health. So Takemi is the leader of this group and we've got uh, uh, some wonderful people, Suze Marvoa, who's with the Environmental Protection Agency, excellent colleague in Japan, a couple of good PhD students, and a couple of really good research fellows. Yeah, good team, and we work with a lot of different data sets. So uh, we've got OzDiab, which is a great data set, and I talked about that with our original TV time work. We've now got the residential locations of every participant in the OzDiab study, originally 11,000, followed up five years later, 6,000, followed up another five years later, we're down to 4,000. But we've got a wonderful prospective study. We've been able to displace their residential address so we could geocode the small areas in which they live to identify walkability and other attributes and socioeconomic attributes. And we're, the Takemi is doing wonderful work with our fellows and students on that. And then we're 
doing something that I think is really good fun, and that is linking transportation survey data sets with the National Health Survey data and geographic information system data, not at the individual level, but at the area level, the small area level, so we can look at uh, walkability, street connectivity, presence of parks, a whole lot of attributes within a, a small area. We can then look at uh, what are the average or the median waist circumferences of people or other health parameters within those areas and uh, what, what do uh, then the health survey also tell us about their habitual behaviour and their walking. So Manoj Chandrabose, who's a, a really talented guy, is actually doing data linkage at the area level to figure out how these different environmental, social and health elements connect up and how it can make a difference. Now, some journals we send our work to say, say oh, you've got, you know, this is just an ecological fallacy. You know, it's attributing, you know, things at a, a kind of environmental level to individuals. And we say, well, you know, actually, you're coming back at us from an individualistic fallacy to accuse us of an ecological fallacy. So it's a, a, a style of thinking and working that, uh, that is interesting and good fun. And we work with a lot of good data. So what have we figured out? Well, here we go. This is our model. Uh, built environment, we believe, is a very important determinant of chronic disease risk. And our hypothesis is that that relationship is significantly mediated through physical activity and sedentary behaviour and it is moderated by socioeconomic gradients and we can capture all of those attributes and see how they might join up. And this is some really interesting work that uh, Manoj Chandrabos has done where it's just come out in uh, transportation research part D, transport and environment, where what he's done is basically looked at environmental and sociodemic attribu attributes, how they relate to physically active and sedentary travel. And basically, he's identified urban sprawl, uh, population density, and some variation in sociodemographic attributes as quite important influences how active on how active can, people can be as they move around in their environments with some implications for transportation and planning and public health sectors on how you can do this. Now Manoj used recursive partitioning, a form of machine learning to crunch through the data to really to see what was thrown up as important determinants. And even when, when we included individual level attributes like SES, education, etc., really in these for these urban dwelling people, environmental attributes really came through quite strongly as important determinants. I mean there's a lot we could talk about with that to explain it. Here's some other work that uh, Takemi Sugiyama has led, which is, I think, just great. What Takemi has done is looked at the rate of high waist circumference and uh, its relationship to people's transportation choices. So where you had uh, active transport, whether it was low or high, people were actually, uh, had a much lower rate of high waist circumference. So that's kind of, you know, the reference point there. People were protected if they were active and used mixed transport, but if they were sitting in cars and that was their primary mode of transport, there was this much higher waist, rate of higher waist circumference and looking at 
transportation diversity if people were living in areas where they had a lot more choice about the kind of transportation modes they used, that seemed to be protective. So the last one, a wonderful study done, done by Chen Yu Lin, uh, who came and worked with us from Waseda University in uh, Tokyo. And what Chen Yu looked at in the Ozdiab study was what is the relationship of social disadvantage with clustered cardiometabolic risk, which we can assess and put together very strongly and clearly from the Ozdiab study, it, what, how much of that is social, how much of social disadvantage, its impact on cardiometabolic risk can be seen to be through physical activity and sedentary behaviour. So it's complex logically and statistically, but the basic story is, okay, what evidence do we find that socioeconomic disadvantage is related to poor metabolic health and how much of that is through people's activity? Well, socioeconomic disadvantage certainly was higher. Higher socioeconomic disadvantage was very much related to a worse cardiometabolic risk score and there's, as socioeconomic disadvantage decreased, cardiometabolic risk decreased. And I won't go into this in detail because of the time, but basically she's shown uh, very interesting relationships of quite strong mediation through moderate vigorous activity, recreational vigorous activity, uh, but much less relationship through sedentary behaviour. So both activity and sedentary behaviour came through as quite strong and important. We got signals from them. But like with a lot of our studies, where you've got people doing regular, moderate, vigorous intensity physical activity, that can be highly protective. It's really important. And there is certainly some evidence that sedentary behaviour remains important, but fundamentally people just really ought to be so much more active than most people are in the normal environments in which we live. So that was a very interesting study and part of our thinking things through. And where does this go? To wrap it all up, uh, the implications of this are that we need better, better designs, more prospective designs. We need further evidence on how physical activity and less sitting might contribute to better health, but also think about food environments, green space and other things. And evidence from natural experiments in this space could be very helpful. So very quickly, where to next? Well. Uh, there are, of course, some real challenges in doing this kind of work, joining the dots between environments, behaviour and health outcomes is perplexing, it's methodologically complex and, of course, it does mess with your head sometimes. So, to wrap this whole thing up, we need to get more evidence from the kind of studies I dealt with in my first talk. Uh, we need to do the kinds of randomised trials that will be convincing for policy makers, for medical people, for people developing WHO guidelines, and particularly, I think, for the sitting work, a big target for us ought to be occupational health and safety. You know, as an environment in which a lot of people do their sitting and an environment in which there ought to be important initiatives that we can get evidence about what could make a difference. So we need to figure these things out, see what we can change, see what we can do, and then 
we need to think about how do we take this into the right places where it can make a difference, join the dots in ways that in will influence policy, and really the overall sense from this picture is, well, it's a complex story for public health, fundamental research that will tease apart what is going on biologically is really important, and doing work that will connect that kind of understanding, especially about physical activity and the time that spend, people spend sitting through looking at car use, urban environments, and the things that ultimately we need better policies and initiatives for to make a difference. We pull all this evidence together. It won't change things, but it will certainly help the people who can change things to potentially make better decisions. Thank you.